I despised the regular gatherings at the county club every few weeks. It felt like there were countless excuses for hosting some frivolous party where a bunch of wealthy individuals could indulge in their egos. While my wife Sandra eagerly anticipated these events, unfortunately, over the past year or so, her drinking had escalated, leading to moments where she embarrassed herself or me. Sandra and I had been married for 24 years and had three college-aged children. We first met while I was pursuing my MBA, and we hit it off immediately. Our relationship began to cool off about a decade ago, and I assumed it was a natural progression. Although I wished for more affection and closeness, I hesitated to push the issue and resigned myself to the idea that our future together might lack romance. Despite this, I had a fulfilling career and earned a substantial income that comfortably supported our family, even with the financial strain of putting our kids through college. Sandra didn't work, preferring to focus on community service and social engagements. Her lifestyle was sustained by my income, which necessitated financial stability. Despite her dedication to upkeep, I noticed she maintained her appearance well, likely due to frequent trips to the spa and salon. Meanwhile, I considered myself average, sporting a slight paunch and graying hair, though I dressed sharply thanks to the demands of my job and my wife's penchant for shopping. I excelled at my job, but deep down I wasn't content. I yearned for something different, something fulfilling that didn't hinge on its paycheck. Additionally, I craved a change of scenery. Our house felt too large for just the two of us, and I loathed the expenses and time required to maintain it. Yet my wife adamantly dismissed any discussion of such radical ideas. She was enamored with her grand residence, the country club scene, and her affluent circle of friends. During one such social gathering, I meandered through the club, engaging in trivial conversations, feeling detached. As the night wore on, I lingered over my final drink while Sandra seemed to be ramping up her drinking. Her excessive indulgence was evident, particularly as she conversed with a group of local ladies. Approaching the scene, I overheard their discussion veering toward lovemaking topics, prompting me to retreat discreetly. Just as I was about to leave, Sandra's voice rang out louder than usual. Hell, if it wasn't for Todd Mitchell, I would never have had any good lovemaking in my lifetime, she exclaimed, oblivious to my presence. The sudden hush that fell over the group indicated they had noticed me nearby. Caught off guard, Sandra turned to see me, her judgment clouded by the drinks. Robert, I didn't realize you were here. You weren't meant to hear that, darling. I apologize. My mistake. She followed with a few tipsy giggles reminiscent of a young girl. The nearby ladies seemed unsure how to respond. Some quietly departed, while the rest remained silent. Sandra shot me a playful smirk, suggesting mischief. Setting my glass down, I exited the room and the club at a leisurely pace. Instead of heading home, I made my way to the airport and within 30 minutes, boarded a commuter flight to Reno. I found Reno much more appealing than Las Vegas, shedding light on my relationship with Sandra. During my time in Reno, I gained insights that had previously eluded me. A weekend there promised further clarity. I switched off my cell phone and easily secured a room at one of the casinos, opening an account with $20,000 and swiftly earning a complimentary room. One interesting aspect of casino accounts is their exemption from federal regulations. No reports are mandated to the government for deposits. While substantial winnings must be reported, deposited funds remain untraceable. Though not particularly interested in gambling, I admired their banking system. When I woke up Saturday at noon, I pondered my circumstances over a burger and fries. Reno appealed to me, its comfortable climate due to high altitude, gaming scene, and proximity to various amenities. Taking a stroll by the Truckee River, I reflected on failed marriages. While not contemplating a Reno divorce, I entertained the idea of tossing my ring into the riverbed someday. As I made my way back to the hotel casino, I noticed a real estate office adorned with various pictures in the front display window. Suddenly, the idea of owning a condo in Reno seemed sensible. Spending an hour in the office and another two driving around, I stumbled upon a small furnished unit that appealed to me. However, purchasing it while married posed a challenge. Fortunately, I arranged a discreet lease-to-buy agreement with a substantial deposit, a concept I initiated and the seller embraced. Taking charge of the family finances early in my marriage proved to be one of my best decisions. Sandra lacked financial acumen, content to leave bill payments to me while enjoying spending. That evening, I treated myself to a delightful sushi dinner. Before retiring for the night, I deposited an additional $10,000 from my Visa card into the casino fund, despite the detested cash advance fee, a sacrifice I deemed worthwhile. 
The next morning, I rose early and savored breakfast at the casino restaurant, relishing eggs, bacon, hash browns, and toast. While leisurely sipping my second cup of coffee, I noticed my waitress sporting a noticeable black eye. Despite her attempt to conceal it, her efforts were futile. She appeared to be a pleasant woman in her mid-forties, but her eagerness seemed slightly forced, suggesting she was new to the job. Although lacking the finesse of a seasoned waitress, her determination to excel impressed me. Your name tag says Donna. Is that your real name? I inquired. No, my name is Dora, but Donna was the closest tag they had, she replied. Well, Dora, I'll take another cup of coffee and I promise a generous tip if you share the story behind the black eye. Why don't I pour you a refill and you can leave a smaller tip while I overlook your question, she countered. Fair enough. It was impolite of me to pry, I conceded. Since I already had the condo key, I decided to gather some essentials to start setting up home. My first stop was the Silver Spur used car lot down the street, where I snagged a well-worn Focus sedan. Although it had seen its fair share of miles, it would suffice for local errands, even though I wouldn't trust it for long trips. Renting was an option, but I anticipated frequent returns, so I opted to buy. With a couple hundred dollars, I managed to acquire everything I needed for comfortable living, including a few changes of clothes. The remainder of the day was spent opening accounts at multiple casinos. I wrote checks payable to the respective casinos, and the funds vanished into my account without leaving a trace. By day's end, I had deposited $60,000 across four different casinos. I kept track of these transactions in a small pocket-sized notebook, recording the amounts, dates, and casino names. This served as a chronological record of my gambling losses over the weekend despite not having wagered a cent. Given my reputation as a poor poker player, any losses in roulette, craps, or blackjack would be plausible. With six months to gather the down payment for the condo, I anticipated no issues. Hunger caught up with me, as I realized I had forgotten about lunch. By dinner time, I was famished. Opting for the casino restaurant where I had breakfast, I was greeted by Dora, my waitress once again. You're still here? Seems like a long day, I remarked. I have to work double shifts to make ends meet. Rent turned out to be higher than expected here. Care for a drink? She replied. Preferring not to pry, I placed my order and maintained polite conversation. When she brought the check, she paused for a moment. I apologize for my attitude this morning. I'm struggling to adjust to this place and I'm feeling self-conscious about my eye. It's a parting gift from my husband when I mentioned divorce. Hopefully, it's the last. Thank you for the generous tip at breakfast. It really helps, she explained, her smile tinged with sadness. Her words lingered in my mind throughout the night. That evening, I realized there wasn't much more I could do immediately. I needed to return home to attend to a few matters before proceeding further. Securing a flight back was no trouble, but I was uncertain about my plans upon arrival. The next morning, Dora was serving at the diner, and I managed to get one of her tables. When she brought the check after the meal, I approached her. I have a small predicament, and I was wondering if you could assist me. I must leave today and won't be back for a week or so. I need someone to house-sit for me. It's a two-bedroom condo, so there won't be any living conflicts. Would you be able to help me out? It'll be for at least a couple of months. Are you serious? She asked. No strings attached. I hate leaving the place unattended. Most of the time, it'll be just you. And when I'm there, I'll stay out of your way. I promise, I reassured her. Though in truth, I didn't mind if someone cleaned the place out. I couldn't let Dora know that. Okay... Is it within walking distance of the diner? She inquired. It's pretty close, but I'm leaving you my car. Also, ensure it always has gas for when I return. I'll call you in advance. There's a machine on the phone, I explained. Dora seemed hesitant, perhaps fearing it was a setup. But I didn't have time to convince her otherwise. Here's the condo key and the car key. The car is parked there. It's a dark blue Ford Focus. Here's the condo address. If you're not comfortable with it, don't worry. I'll retrieve the keys when I return next Friday. I said, jotting down the address on a napkin and handing it to her. She accepted the napkin and keys, still uncertain. Dora, don't stress about it. If you're not up for it, it's okay. If you decide against it, that's fine too, I reassured her. An hour later, I boarded my flight home. Although I would have preferred to stay in Reno, I drove by the house after retrieving my car from the long-term lot. Seeing Sandra's car gone, I quickly packed a few essentials for the week. Underwear, clothes, shoes, and my laptop which took less than 10 minutes. I also retrieved my passport and birth certificate. The company had a few kitchenette-style units available for use, and my position allowed me to utilize one as needed. 
I booked it for the next two weeks and began charging my laptop battery before calling my eldest son, Jason. I explained to him that his mother and I were experiencing some domestic issues and that I would be occupied for a while. I asked him to convey this to his sisters at Auburn University and reassure them not to worry. Despite all three of them being enrolled there, I still had to pay out-of-state tuition, though thankfully I could afford it. After hanging up, I plugged my cell phone into charge and took a shower. The only sustenance I had on the plane was a bag of peanuts, so I eagerly anticipated a satisfying dinner. Monday proved to be a hectic day. Prior to anything else, I visited the bank and secured a substantial second mortgage on the house, surpassing its current value. By the end of the month, this situation would change. Directly from the bank, I reached out to Auburn University and arranged prepaid tuition for my children, wiring $240,000 to the school. This left me with a cashier's check of just over $200,000 to take to Reno. I cashed in two CDs, paying the penalties, and closed out my money market account. I opted to leave the credit cards untouched until the month's end, realizing I was already running late for work. My loyal secretary greeted me with black coffee and a knowing smile. Good morning, Mr. Terrell. Are you going to fill me in on what happened at the county club on Friday, or should I just believe the rumors? She quipped. Emily, the rumors are all accurate. Anything else you need to know? I replied. Without hesitation, she responded. What do you need me to do to assist? Get me all the information you can find on Todd Mitchell. I believe he used to work here, but I'm not certain. Arrange for my scheduled work to be handled by the staff and ensure any appointments or meetings I've set up remain unchanged. Any questions so far? Emily left the office with a broad smile and a thumbs up, ready to tackle the tasks ahead. Initially, I had anticipated it would take several weeks to sort out my affairs, but now I realize it could all be wrapped up within a week. I promptly called my lawyer and scheduled an immediate appointment. Before leaving, I instructed Emily that I would neither be accepting nor returning any phone calls from my wife, and security was instructed not to permit her entry into the building. Jerry Proctor, a college friend of mine, was never fond of Sandra, making him the ideal candidate to handle my divorce. I was at the country club on Friday, Robert, so I think I understand why you're here, Jerry remarked. You're correct. I'm not trying to be sarcastic, Bob, but it's time you were right again. I thought I could endure it as long as I wasn't publicly embarrassed, but that changed on Friday. I need access to all your accounts and a couple of powers of attorney. I'll have my assistant prepare everything and give you a call. Is there anything specific I should be aware of? I responded. Well, Jerry, unfortunately, the events of Friday triggered something in me. I've developed a gambling dependence. I spent the weekend in Reno and lost a significant amount of money. I'm going back next weekend and I fear it will be even worse, I confessed. Gee, that's terrible, buddy. I assume you're keeping records of all these losses, Jerry replied with a grin. I have been, and I will continue to do so. It might be wise for me to send you copies of everything, I agreed. Absolutely. You know, Bob, I don't think we should discuss this further, agreed, Jerry suggested. You're right. Do you need anything else? I inquired. I'm good, Bob. Get out of here and handle your business. Jerry advised, handing me a financial worksheet to fill out before my next visit to sign the forms. It was then that I realized I had skipped lunch. Emily had a helpful sheet prepared for me, providing information about Todd Mitchell. She suggested I speak with Wilma Grimm in the personnel department before proceeding. Wilma, a longtime employee, always exuded confidence with her business suits and tightly pulled back bun, making her slightly intimidating to anyone who encountered her. If Emily thought it was necessary for me to meet with her, it must be important. Good afternoon, Mr. Terrell. Please have a seat, she greeted me, attempting to put me at ease, though it wasn't quite successful. It felt akin to being in a room with a strict nun teacher. Despite my status as a grown man in a significant position, I couldn't help but feel overwhelmed by this woman. She closed her office door before speaking. Emily briefed me on the situation. I don't indulge in office gossip, but I deal strictly in facts. Three years ago, Todd Mitchell confided in me. I swore to keep his disclosures confidential. Unfortunately, it seems I can no longer honor that pledge. If anything I say offends you, feel free to leave, and our discussion will end. If you disagree with what you hear, direct your frustration elsewhere. I'm merely presenting the facts. Do you comprehend, Mr. Terrell? She stated firmly. Yes, I understand. I believe I can handle whatever you disclose without resorting to a temper tantrum, I replied, attempting a light-hearted remark, though it was met with a slight frown from her. Approximately three and a half years ago, your wife, Sandra, approached Todd Mitchell at a company event. There was heavy drinking that night, 
and before it concluded, Todd and Sandra engaged in carnal activity in one of the private offices. Todd was set to marry the following month. Sandra threatened to reveal their affair to his fiancée unless he continued their liaisons. He hoped that once he married, she would cease her demands, but she persisted, coercing him into continued carnal encounters for several months under the threat of exposure. In a state of desperation, Todd sought my assistance. Naturally, he had to divulge the entire ordeal. Ethically, I couldn't disclose this information to you or anyone else. The best solution I could devise was to transfer Todd to another office. After relocating to Dallas, Sandra ceased her advances. Todd never disclosed the situation to his wife. Do you have any questions? It appears Mr. Mitchell was as much a sufferer in this debacle as anyone else. Initially, I contemplated some form of retribution, but that now seems imprudent. Any suggestions, Miss Grimm? Now that you're aware of your influence, I suggest letting the matter rest. Todd Mitchell is a valuable employee and an asset to the company. Don't jeopardize his career over something your wife initiated, she recommended. Thank you for your time. I agree with you. Being coerced into closeness with my wife is punishment in itself. As we rose, Wilma smiled, adding, By the way, it's not Miss. I've been married for 32 years. It was difficult to envision Wilma Grimm in a lovemaking setting with a man. However, perhaps when she lets her guard down, she transforms into a sort of lovemaking symbol. Suddenly, thoughts of a dominatrix crossed my mind, prompting me to shift focus. I had more pressing matters than Wilma's romantic life. Emily had rearranged my schedule, leaving me with a clean slate. Despite my wife's persistent calls, insisting I wasn't in Baltimore, I remained undeterred. As Emily had suggested, I had an appointment with the company president the next day, and one with the legal department that afternoon. I invited Emily to join me for supper, but she declined, citing her husband's disapproval. She jokingly proposed I ask Wilma instead. The meeting in the legal department took longer than expected, resulting in me retaining a few individuals. Over time, I extended apologies, which were met with understanding. Redeeming my retirement plan for a cash settlement proved challenging. Closing the shared savings account went smoothly, but required time for processing. Dealing with my sick time, vacation time, and company insurance, however, was relatively straightforward compared to other tasks. It had become quite evident by then that I would be departing from the company. I hoped the news wouldn't reach my wife prematurely. I ended up dining alone, strangely finding my thoughts drifting to Dora during the meal. I pondered whether she had moved into the condo, and if she was still working double shifts. Despite my limited acquaintance with her, I felt a keen desire to return to Reno and see her. Recognizing the juvenile nature of these thoughts, I attempted to dismiss them. It was imprudent to waste time pondering fantasies that would never materialize. The following morning, I cashed in two whole life insurance policies and terminated two term policies. I was astounded by the substantial cash value the whole life policies had accrued. I arranged to collect the checks the following day. While my car was covered by company insurance, I canceled the insurance on Sandra's Lexus, as the lease was under her name while the insurance was under mine. Before heading into work, I dropped by Jerry's office, submitted the financial form, and signed several papers his secretary had prepared. Upon my return to the office, Emily had coffee ready. I don't mean to add insult to injury, boss, but you should speak with Calvin Bostick down in settlements before meeting with Richard, she advised. Richard Ryder, the company president, likely already knew the purpose of my visit. The settlements division was situated in the basement, an odd arrangement compared to the other department's locations, enjoying natural light and windows while they were relegated to what felt like a dungeon. Calvin? Emily mentioned you wanted to speak with me. I greeted Calvin Bostick, a reserved individual who always efficiently completed his tasks. He led me to a secluded area. I've heard rumblings about tensions in your office. I'm not one for gossip, but I felt you should be aware of something. About six years ago, we had a colleague named Raymond Upright. He was a decent guy, married with two children. He became entangled with your wife after an office event. She persistently contacted him at home and in the office. He regretted his actions and attempted to end the affair, but she wouldn't allow it, threatening to expose him to his wife if he tried to break it off. Foolishly, he called her bluff. Two days later, Raymond's wife threw him out. He spiraled into drunkenness and lost his job. I'm uncertain of his current whereabouts. Nonetheless, Raymond's wife threatened to disclose your wife's affair to you. Allegedly, your wife paid her $10,000 to remain silent. I lack concrete evidence regarding this last detail. Thanks, Cal. 
I hope I didn't upset you, Mr. Terrell. But Emily suggested I inform you. You made the right call. I appreciate it, I acknowledged. I rode the elevator straight to the ninth floor, arriving a bit early for my appointment with Mr. Ryder. Nonetheless, he promptly ushered me in. The meeting was brief and to the point. The legal department, personnel department, and payroll would handle everything for me. Once the details were sorted out, I was instructed to personally contact Mr. Ryder from wherever I was. He handed me a card with his private cell number on the back. There were no assurances, no regrets, and no nonsense. While some matters were resolved, others remained open-ended. I simply nodded and departed without uttering a word. Emily greeted me with a wide smile upon my return to the office. As she handed me my usual cup of coffee, I returned the smile and instructed her to book me a flight to Reno for Thursday morning, with a two-hour layover in Dallas. She gestured for me to look out the window. Sandra was in the parking lot, engaged in a heated argument with a security guard. She's been down there for over 20 minutes. They won't let her in and she refuses to leave. What do you want to do, boss? It seems the guards have the situation handled. My only concern now is finding someone to have dinner with. I dislike dining alone, I remarked. I called Jerry to check on things. He informed me he couldn't take action until I resolved the financial mess. Currently, I was financially stable. With the incoming checks and cash in the bank, I was rather affluent. I assured Jerry I would head to Reno early and not return until I was penniless. Periodically, someone would pop their head into my office, informing me that my wife wanted me to call her. She had her friends call their husbands at work in an attempt to locate me. I lingered in the office for a few more hours, tidying up to ease the transition for my replacement. Sandra sat on the hood of my car, awaiting my exit. Emily flashed a smile as she handed over the keys to her Honda Civic. She mentioned it was a good excuse to have her husband pick her up and treat her to dinner. By the way, you're not planning anything reckless in Dallas, are you? Nope, just wrapping up loose ends. No revenge, I assure you. I drove to Allentown and grabbed dinner at the Outback. I was back in my apartment before midnight. The following morning flew by. I signed more paperwork for Jerry, closed all the bank accounts, and canceled all the credit cards. I even arranged to have the utilities shut off at the house. The next week, I collected checks from the bank, insurance company, and workplace. I was surprised to find out I was worth so much. I got a new cell phone and canceled the ones my wife and I had. I sold my country club membership to an old friend for $23,000. My replacement was already in position when I made my final stop at work. He appeared to be a nice guy, and he had arrived from Boston with just 24 hours notice. He understood it was a smart move for him. Emily was more knowledgeable about office operations than I was, so training him wasn't necessary. There were a few items at the house I wished I had, but they weren't significant enough for me to return. Emily told me to keep her car, and her husband would pick it up at the airport. I bought a couple of cheap suitcases to pack my belongings from the apartment. Anything I forgot, I could purchase in Reno. Suddenly it dawned on me that I had completed everything I needed to do. All my assets were now in cash. There were no stocks, no accounts, and nothing else of value except the house, which I was gifting to my wife. Air Blue was accommodating. They had available seats and were happy to move up my flight. I called Jerry at home. Hey buddy, just wanted to let you know I'm leaving tonight. I assume you have everything you need? I'm all set, Bob. I can serve the papers tomorrow. But I still need that financial info ASAP. You might as well give them to her. I'll start sending proof of financial irresponsibility soon. Be cautious, Bob. I don't want either of us in trouble. Sandra will probably get a fancy lawyer, maybe from Philly. He might bail if things go south. It's up to you, Jerry. Do your best for me. But keep the bill reasonable. I'll be strapped for cash soon. Don't forget that. One more thing. Look into a guy named Raymond Upright. He might need a hand. Depending on the situation, I might be the one to help. Got it, Bobby. Safe travels and keep in touch. I called the condo and left a message on the machine about my arrival later that night. I reassured her I'd call and not to be alarmed by someone at the door. At this point, I didn't know if she'd be there. I hoped so. It was strange. I hardly knew her. Yet I hoped for some kind of relationship. For now, friendship would suffice. Her vulnerability made me cautious not to exploit it. I reached Dallas early enough for a leisurely breakfast. I was waiting in Todd Mitchell's office when he arrived, visibly displeased. Mr. Terrell, I'd say it's nice to see you, but that'd be a lie. We both know it. Relax, Todd. I hope you don't mind the informality. I'm not here to reprimand you. I wanted to let you know I understand your situation from before, and there are no hard feelings. 
You could have done that over the phone. I know, but I was passing through and felt it was worth my time to clear the air. I don't get it. Why bother? I messed up. I should be apologizing to you. You're not solely to blame. I was foolish too. I'm too ashamed to even tell my wife. You played a part, but most of the trouble was caused by my wife. What she did caused problems for you and now for me. I'm not excusing you entirely, but I don't want you carrying more guilt than necessary. Because my dear wife was unfaithful. That's very kind of you to put it that way. I'm at a loss for words or actions in response. I reached over and passed him one of Jerry's cards. Later today, give my lawyer a ring. There's a chance he might need your help. It'll be kept confidential. He might say he doesn't need anything. At most, he might ask for a notarized statement confirming the affair. I assure you, it won't reach your wife. We shook hands as I stood up. An odd gesture given his betrayal, but it felt appropriate. Todd Mitchell was a decent man who didn't deserve his life to be ruined over a mistake, even if it was repeated. An hour later, I was on my flight back to Reno, pondering where I went wrong. I had worked tirelessly to provide for my family. I thought I did a commendable job. Yet while I ensured everyone's well-being, I neglected my wife. In situations like this, we often search for our own faults. Usually I find myself to blame, and I can accept that. But when it comes to Sandra's infidelity, it's a betrayal I cannot justify or excuse. Had she been discreet, perhaps I would have shouldered the blame and let it go. But her lack of discretion absolves me of guilt. The evening concluded on a positive note. Upon landing at Reno Tahoe International, I was pleasantly surprised to find Dora waiting at baggage claim. She wore jeans and a light blue Oxford shirt, a departure from her usual uniform. I hadn't intended for her to pick me up when I called. I simply wanted her to be aware of my arrival. Good evening, Dora. I didn't expect to see you. I thought since I had your car, it was the least I could do. Aren't you on duty? No, I managed to cut back thanks to your kind offer. Oh, I wasn't being kind. I was just trying to find a way for us to be alone. And what do you plan to do when you have me alone? I'm not sure yet. I haven't thought that far ahead. Any suggestions? As I retrieved my luggage from the carousel, I noticed Dora blush slightly. It seemed like a cue to dial back before I scared her off. Her teasing question indicated she was comfortable enough to joke, which was a positive sign. Thirty minutes later, we returned to a freshly decorated apartment. It was adorned with small touches that didn't break the bank but significantly enhanced the overall ambiance. In gratitude for her efforts in sprucing up the apartment and picking me up at the airport, I treated us to two prime rib dinners. It seemed Dora enjoyed the wine more than the beef. How's the divorce proceeding? Pretty poorly. I still have three weeks left before I can even file. You need six weeks to establish residency. Despite what everyone said, I thought this would be straightforward. I probably would have been better off handling it from home. Why didn't you? Dora paused, fiddling with her food before looking up. Getting away from Tony was more crucial than getting the divorce. The divorce is just a piece of paper that won't shield me from further misuse. I think I used the divorce as an excuse to justify coming out here. The location wasn't important. What mattered was that I left. Dora's explanation resonated with me. Initially, divorcing Sandra seemed significant, but now I wasn't so sure. All I truly wanted was to prevent her from benefiting from the marriage, unless I had intentions of remarriage, which I didn't. It didn't matter. The remainder of the evening was spent discussing more mundane topics like hobbies, movies, and books. Dora didn't have children, and I didn't inquire further. We slept in separate bedrooms that night. Dora had already left for work by the time I woke up. Fresh coffee awaited me, and that was all I needed. I still felt full from last night's indulgence. After a quick shower, I got down to business. Jerry, how's my favorite attorney holding up? There was a sigh from the other end of the line. Not worth a dime. Robert, I've got some bad news for you. Can you promise not to shoot the messenger? Oh, geez. I've only been away for one day. What happened? Sandra's caused quite a stir. She found out about the bank accounts and other things. After contacting the police, she managed to secure a restraining order against just about everything. All your accounts are frozen, even though they're empty. You're forbidden from coming near her or the house, taking anything from the house, or contacting your children, even though they're legally adults. Most of it seems like nonsense, but sorting it all out will take a lot of time and money if you want to fix it. She even contacted the Securities and Exchange Commission about your 401 K and retirement accounts. Somehow she's got the IRS looking into things too. Jerry, I don't know how to say this, but I want no part of any of it. I'm done. 
Do you understand? I hear you loud and clear, buddy. Just so you know, she's also hired a private investigator to track you down. I wonder how she plans to pay for all this. Don't know, and I don't care. Remember, if the cops or feds ask me where you are, I'll have to tell them. I won't risk my career for you, even though we're friends. I get it, Jerry. Protect yourself. I'll make some adjustments on my end. I won't be calling you again for a while. Thanks for your understanding, buddy. Well, that throws a wrench in the works. Even the best laid plans can go awry in a flash. I had to switch to plan B and I didn't even have one. My brilliant idea to pretend to lose all my money in the casinos was shot down. I decided not to reach out to anyone else. Fortunately, Dora left me the car, which was a relief. I don't know how she got to work. I was left with a small duffel bag full of money and checks. I had to visit six different casinos to cash all my checks and exchange them for chips or credit. I was hesitant to go to the banks in case there was a hold or trace on anything. The casinos were more than willing to assist. By the end of the morning, I had everything deposited at several places and a bag filled with cash and chips. After a quick lunch, I initiated the withdrawals. Within two hours, all the chips had been exchanged for cash, and all the cash had been withdrawn from the casino accounts. I now possessed a substantial amount of money, and there were no problems or suspicious occurrences thus far. It took me under an hour to drive to Carson City. There, I rented a large safety deposit box at a small, inconspicuous bank and stored everything except $5,000, which I kept for incidental expenses. With everything now secure, I looked forward to another leisurely dinner with Dora to celebrate. I had a hunch something was amiss. Upon entering the condo, Dora was scrambling to rectify things that shouldn't have been disturbed in the first place. She immediately looked up at me, partly covering her face. I'm sorry, Robert. It's my fault. I don't know how he found me and I didn't realize he was following me until I arrived at the apartment. I should have been more cautious. I'm truly sorry. Gently, I lowered her hand from her face. Dora sported a new black eye and a swollen lip, along with a large bluish bruise on her right cheek. Was it Tony? She nodded, confirming. He had his two brothers with him. They're out searching for you now. Tony instructed me not to leave the condo. Where are they searching? I gave them the names of three casinos. They're clueless about your appearance. They're not thinking clearly. It was obvious. We couldn't stay, and involving the police wasn't an option. We left everything behind, headed west, and spent the night at a small off-road motel in Grass Valley. Despite there being only one bed, I acted chivalrously. I brought takeout to the room and bought some makeup for Dora. She did her best to conceal the bruises, but it was still noticeable. She apologized profusely throughout the night. I felt relieved when she finally fell asleep. The next day, we drove to Sacramento to buy clothing and personal items. I had no idea when we could return to the condo. I had booked the Grass Valley Motel for two additional nights. Over the next few days, Dora and I got acquainted. There was no closeness or suggestive remarks. After just three days, I felt more at ease with her than I did with my wife of 24 years. While I wasn't conversing with Dora, I fretted over the unfolding events. I was hesitant to bring Dora back to the condo, fearing Tony might find her. Similarly, I was apprehensive about returning myself, concerned that someone might be searching for me. Yet carelessly, I left behind my laptop, passport, and other personal documents at the condo. Foolishly, I deemed them significant and felt compelled to retrieve them. Truly foolish. Despite only knowing Dora for a short time, I felt compelled to trust her. We were both in the same predicament regarding our spouses. Have you ever been to Mexico? No, I haven't. Are we considering going to Mexico, Robert? I'm uncertain. But in case things take a turn for the worse, I need you to do something for me. I don't want you getting into trouble and I want to keep you safe from Tony. Robert, you don't owe me anything. You've already done more than enough. I'll manage. Well, I'm not certain about my own situation. I've stashed away a significant amount of money. It's clean money, but I'm hiding it from my wife. If anything happens to me, I need you to retrieve the cash for me. Who's after you? You haven't mentioned anything about that. Did you do something illegal? There are multiple federal agencies and a private detective looking for me. If necessary, the local police will likely get involved. All I'm trying to do is safeguard some money for my wife. What should I do with this money? I've been pondering that. Head to Guadalajara and wait for me there. Use whatever funds you need until I arrive. How will you locate me? Visit the Libertad Market for coffee every morning. I'll find you. It's sizable, but I'll find you. When should I do this? When you realize I'm in trouble. 
Why not do it now? Be patient. I'll bring you along. I'd prefer us to go together rather than separately. It feels safer that way. Why can't we both leave now? The conversation began to loop, so I disregarded her. I didn't intend to be rude, just eager to proceed. Two hours later, we crossed the pass and arrived in Carson City. Dora's name was added to the access for the safety deposit box, and she received her own key. Upon returning to the condo, I parked half a block away. The complex had a lower-level parking area beneath the units, open but covered. I instructed Dora to wait in the car until I confirmed there wouldn't be any issues. What kind of problem? I had no clue. Given recent events, anything was possible, and it unfolded as I wandered through the parking lot. Robert Terrell, turn around. He was a slight man, somewhat wiry. The lengthy leather coat he sported seemed more odd than menacing. He lacked the demeanor to pull it off. However, the sizable black weapon in his grip compensated. Do we know each other? A broad grin stretched across his face as if he took pride in revealing his identity. I'm Laszlo. Your wife sent me. All right. What do you need from me? I require your wedding ring and your wallet. The wedding ring I understand, but why the wallet? I need to make it seem like a robbery. Make what appear as a robbery? Your wife hired me to eliminate you, Mr. Terrell. I hope she paid you up front because she's broke. What do you mean? That marked the end of our dialogue. From afar, three burly Italians clad in lengthy leather coats emerged. Bobby Terrell, we need to have a word with you. Tony was particularly vocal. Their abrupt arrival caught Laszlo off guard. As they noticed the firearm in his hand, all three reached for their own concealed weapons as I hurled myself over the concrete barrier toward the exterior of the parking lot. Laszlo temporarily lost interest in me. As I dashed along the building's side toward the car, gunfire reverberated off the garage walls. Glancing up, I spotted Dora racing down the street and two suited men exiting a black SUV across the way. It was evident they were federal agents, presumably awaiting my arrival. The shootout provided a distraction, allowing me to flee the area. Dora and the car were nowhere to be seen. There was no chance I was returning to that condo. I didn't care who shot whom in the parking garage. I just wanted out. What I knew for certain was that three different factions were after me for various reasons. It was clear to me that I needed to lay low for a while. While I had over four grand on hand, catching a bus to Carson City to retrieve my money wasn't a viable option. I was too much of a target at the moment. Yeah, hot is the right word for it. I was just trying to escape from a wife who betrayed me. What had gone wrong? Why was my wife attempting to have me eliminated? Perhaps she hadn't realized there was no longer any insurance payout. I had overestimated her intelligence. That was my blunder. So I took a bus to San Francisco. A grand doesn't stretch far in the city by the bay. The first thousand secured me a social security number and an ID, allowing me to seek employment. I found a modest room with shared facilities and landed a job as a waiter in a discreet eatery. After about a month, I was earning enough to sustain myself and was becoming quite adept at waiting tables. Some patrons even requested my section. I hadn't kept up with my cell phone payments and the service had been cut off. Since leaving Reno, I hadn't used it anyway. It only cost me a few bucks to set up a new prepaid service with 50 minutes of airtime. I wanted to reach out to Dora, but I had no clue where she was, so I decided to call Jerry. Hey, Jerry, it's Robert. Just wanted to touch base. Bobby, Bobby, good to hear from you. Things are still chaotic, but not quite as you might expect. Where the heck are you? None of your business where I am. Last time we spoke, I was besieged by unsavory characters all wanting something. Am I still a marked man? Well, most of that mess cleared up, especially after Sandra got arrested. From what I gather, the IRS is still pursuing payment on 401k assets. Apart from that, things are looking up. What do you mean Sandra was arrested? I thought you, of all people, would know about it. Ever heard of a guy named Lester Laszlo? Yeah, I briefly met him about three months back. He was attempting to off me when we were interrupted by some other fellows who had a bone to pick with me. While they were arguing over who would get a shot at me, I slipped out the back door. How does he tie in? Sandra hired Laszlo to take you out. Laszlo got seriously injured in Reno and spilled everything to the cops. He claimed Sandra was stiffing him on a $10,000 contract, so he squealed. Believe it or not, the cops bought it and slapped her with charges. She's stuck in jail awaiting trial because she can't make bail. Jerry, I'd consider helping her out if she hadn't tried to have me bumped off. Her parents should bail her out, not me. Let me see what I can do. Bobby, no one seems too interested in you right now. Want me to restart the divorce proceedings? 
I think we have solid grounds this time. Might as well. Divorce would tidy things up, though I couldn't care less at this point. I've kept all the paperwork. I reckon I can still use most of it. Oh, forgot to mention, your kids all returned home when Sandra got in trouble. They were worried initially, but lost interest once the truth came out. They want you to reach out and reassure them you're okay. I'll contact them as soon as I can. How'd your money laundering plan pan out? Not worth a lick. Lost control and lost touch. I'll try to check on it next week. Jerry, sometimes even the best laid plans fall flat. Okay, stay in touch, buddy. One more thing, Jerry. Did Sandra ever say why she wanted me dead? Not that I know of. I figured it was for the insurance, unaware that you'd canceled. I touched base with the kids, and everything's fine. They felt better knowing their tuition was prepaid. They were curious about what went down between Sandra and me, but I couldn't bring myself to spill the beans. Some things will have to wait. I borrowed a car and drove up to Carson City. The safety deposit box turned out to be empty. She could have left a note, at least. I couldn't really gripe since I gave her the key and access. Did she head to Guadalajara, or did she find a hideout beyond my reach? There was only one way to find out. In my San Francisco neighborhood, there were several small travel agencies, most specializing in group tours for like-minded people, which I didn't quite fit into. Finally, I found a tour to my favorite Mexican city with a last-minute cancellation I could snag. It was the first time I had to scrape together enough money for something. The trip wasn't overly pricey. I just didn't have much cash. I felt at ease since a few guys from the restaurant were on the trip. Most signed up for side trips, but I had other plans. The first two days were a letdown. The Libertad market was larger than I anticipated. In hindsight, it wasn't the best choice. I hated to entertain the idea that maybe Dora had taken my money and jetted off somewhere more exotic. Perhaps Bangkok or Tahiti. There was enough money in that safety deposit box to live almost anywhere. I was torn between waiting for her to pass by or searching for her. Ended up doing both. By the third day, it was getting dull. About time, Robert. Where have you been? I turned and saw Dora, hands on hips, wearing a wide-brimmed straw hat with a red band. I didn't say anything. I walked over and kissed her for the first time. Don't know why I hadn't done it earlier. Glad I did now. That's a pretty lame excuse. Try it again. The second kiss came with a big hug as I lifted her off the ground. Dora, I missed you so much. You'll have to tell me where you've been for the last month later. Let's go home and have some lunch. We strolled through the market hand in hand. Felt happy and content for the first time in a while. Robert, don't be mad, but I used some of your money. Most of it's in the bank. But I needed a place to live. So I bought us a house. I hoped you wouldn't mind with all that money in the bank. It's a beautiful hacienda in a beautiful city, and I'm with a wonderful woman. Love it when a plan comes together. Sandra's parents managed to gather her bail money and cover her legal fees. Jerry easily obtained her signature on the divorce documents. She received a five to eight year sentence for attempting to have me eliminated. The reason behind Todd Mitchell providing a deposition to Jerry remained a mystery, but Jerry never needed to use it. Jerry successfully located Ray Upright, who was sober but struggling. When asked how he could assist, Ray expressed a desire for a hot dog push cart, which I was able to provide for $2,400. I resolved my issues with the IRs for $4,000. Laszlo is currently incarcerated in Nevada, along with Dora's husband and brothers. The duration of their stay is uncertain. With no legal troubles looming over me, I was free to return home to my old job, now with a promotion awaiting me. Once Dora's Mexican divorce is finalized, we intend to marry. The kids are scheduled to attend the wedding during spring break. While the house in Guadalajara is stunning, we're inclined not to make it our permanent residence. Dora prefers to keep it as a vacation home. Emily eagerly anticipates my return to work, particularly in the new role, which signifies a promotion for both of us. Dora is flexible about our future location as long as we're together. She's keen for me to introduce her to Sandra, which promises to be an interesting encounter. Though my plans didn't unfold as expected, I have no grounds to complain.